This video is picking up right where the previous video left off. We are still in part 080, Matrix Algebra. I'm scrolling down to the matrix powers, inverses, determinant, and identity start. Uh, this is just a note in the document to denote a separate section of this document, mostly for my purposes. We're around line 230 in the document. Link to this in the description. All the code that I'm going to show you here is going to work perfectly in Octave, just as it does here in MATLAB, with some very, very minor exceptions, which I will note when I get to them. So the first thing I want to show you here is just distinguishing between the caret, the exponent symbol, and the dot caret, or element-wise squaring symbol. So let me run this section here. So I've got this matrix, just some arbitrary numbers that I threw into it. And when I multiply that matrix times itself, using matrix multiplication, I get this result here, which is the exact same thing that I get if I square it using matrix squaring. But it is a different thing than what I get when I do element-wise squaring right here. I think it shouldn't be too hard to understand that a times a is the same as a squared, in the same way that a dot caret 2 is actually the same as a dot star a. All right, so there's that matrix, and there it is again. Continuing on down. In the same way that a cubed is the same as a matrix multiplied times a matrix multiplied times a again. So there's a cubed and there's a matrix multiplied times itself another two times over. Not all matrices can be squared. In fact, the word square gives you a really big hint. A matrix has to have the same number of rows as it has columns in order to be squared or raised to any other power. So here, so here I try to square this matrix that is not square, it's rectangular. It has three rows and two columns, and that simply does not work. Incorrect dimensions for raising a matrix to a power. Matrix multiplication is not like regular old scalar multiplication or element-wise multiplication. In those multiplications, the order does not matter. But in matrix multiplication, it absolutely does, because we need these inner dimensions to match up. And even a matrix itself might not have inner dimensions matching up. In fact, it won't unless it has the same number of rows as it has columns. So this section, I a little bit regret the way I did this, and I probably should have changed it, but I'm just going to run it and go with it anyway. Um, the one thing in this section that will not work in Octave is the table function. I'm using table right here to make it easier to read. So for example, if I just got rid of table and then reran this section, and then scroll up to the top, you will see that like it wraps around because of the spacing that is used. It just shows like column one, two, three, and then moves column three down to the next uh, line. I don't like that. I find that obnoxious. But if you display the table of your matrix, the table function, for whatever reason, forces it to fit in whatever width you have. And if you narrow it too much, well, then it just scrolls off the screen and you need to scroll over to it. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, the table function doesn't exist in Octave at present as of making of this video, so uh, you'll just have to delete that word off of these displays, and then this section will work in Octave. I am generating a random 3x3 three three matrix. I also a little bit regret that. Uh, randomness, you should have a really good reason for using it if you are using it, and I don't have a really good reason here. But in any case, we're just going to go with it. So A is a random 3x3 three three matrix with values between 0 and 1. And there you can see this version that I generated here. Yours will be different because it's random. And then I take A and I raise it to the negative 1 power to get the inverse of A, which is this right here. There are at least two ways of doing this. One is to raise the matrix to the negative 1 power. The other is to use the inverse function, which is abbreviated INV. And if I scroll down, you can see that I get the exact same result using that function as I got raising a to the negative one power. Now the matrix inverse has a special property, and that is when you multiply a matrix times its inverse, you get the identity matrix. Now an identity matrix is a very special matrix. It's kind of like the one, the number one of matrix multiplication. In that, in scalar multiplication, whenever you multiply a number times one, you get your original number. One is the identity of scalar multiplication and of scalar division. And there's different identities for different operators. The identity of addition and subtraction is zero, because when you add or subtract zero, 
you get the number that you were adding it to. You get the original number. In matrix multiplication, when you multiply by an identity matrix, you get the matrix that you started with. And the identity matrix is a matrix with all zeros with ones along the diagonal. I'm going to very briefly open up a new document and give you a little demo of the identity matrix here. All right, so there's my matrix X. And when I multiply X by the three by three identity matrix, I get X. It is unchanged by that multiplication. And in this rare particular situation, it doesn't actually matter what order I multiply it in, it still works. And there I just reran it. You can't even tell. The identity is only for three by three matrices. That's what the three is saying here, right? If X is instead a two by two matrix, I need to use a different identity. This will not work. I get an error. But if I multiply by the two by two identity matrix, then it works perfectly. So we still need to size our matrix to have the right number of rows and columns. But uh, in any case, any multiplication times the identity, you get the matrix that you started with. All right, back to the rest of my MATLAB code. Now, the other thing that I said was, when I multiply a matrix times its inverse, I get the identity matrix. And this here is the three by three identity matrix. If I did like a five by five identity matrix, uh, well, it wouldn't fit on the screen, but let's try it again. You know, again, it's just ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. But it kind of looks bad, my identity matrix that I'm claiming to have gotten from this calculation right here. It's this. Well, that doesn't look like this, does it? It looks pretty different. There are ones along the diagonal, and there's certainly some zeros off the diagonal. But what the heck's this? And this? And this? And this? Well, these are numbers that are very, very close to zero. Remember your scientific notation. This means roughly negative 2.8 times 10 to the negative 17th power. So that's zero point and then 16 zeros before a non-zero digit. How does this happen? This happens because MATLAB has some rounding errors. MATLAB can't perfectly represent numbers with decimal places that go on and on and on and on. It's got to give up at some point and say, well, this is how much memory I've allotted to this number, and we're going to round it at that point. So rounding errors will occur. Be aware of that so that you can still identify this as probably an identity matrix, or certainly something very, very close to it. I also just noticed I have a little typo right here. Backslash N for a new line symbol when you're displaying. It doesn't actually work with display. So what I should have just done is closed off that display and made a new one on the next line. And then you could actually read uh, that text there. There it is. That's a very minor thing. So don't worry too much about that. Continuing on down right here, a singular matrix. So not all matrices have inverses. And those that don't are called singular, or sometimes ill-conditioned matrices. But since that's hard to say, we'll just say singular. So for example, we have this matrix right here, and let's check it out. All right, so MATLAB is going to warn me that this matrix is singular to working precision, and then it's going to give me a 2 by 2 matrix, but it's full of infinities, which is a little bit weird. This singular to working precision bit is MATLAB's way of warning us that MATLAB might be wrong. MATLAB has to round off its numbers at some point. It doesn't have infinite accuracy. So to the amount of precision that it does have, matrix appears to be singular. It appears to not have an inverse. Now the code still runs and it gives you a matrix full of infinities, which I wish it didn't do. I think that's probably not the best solution to this, but that's what MATLAB does. Now, why doesn't that work? I'm not really going to justify it here. I'm not going to prove it by any means, but I'm going to show you something that is true of matrices that don't have inverses. If you think of that matrix as representing a system of equations, the system is going to have either no solution or infinite solutions when there is no inverse. So for example, I've got this system of equations right here. I just took the numbers from the matrix and use those as the coefficients on the variables. So I got one and two here, I got one x plus two y here. I got two and four here, so I have two x plus four y here. Now, both of those are set equal to these numbers. Where did these come from? I just made them up, and it actually doesn't matter what these values are, you'll still either have no solution or infinite solutions. So let's go ahead and try and solve it using elimination. I'm gonna multiply the first equation by two, both sides. I'm allowed to do that because it keeps the equation balanced and equal. And I end up with two of the same equation. 
So when I subtract them, and this subtraction would be like distributed to both sides, uh, negative 2x, negative 4y, negative 6, and then I get 0x plus 0y equals 0, but that's infinite solutions, right? I can plug in any x and y I want, it doesn't really matter, I'll still get the same result if I'm multiplying by 0 throughout. Now what if I didn't have 3 and 6 here? And like you can check it with any numbers you want, but I'm going to make it easy on myself and just do 6 and 6. So then I'm multiplying uh, instead 2 by 6, and then I get 12 here, and then I subtract, and then I get a 6 here. Well, now it's not infinite solutions, it's no solutions. Because no matter what x and y I plug in, there's no way I can get 6. Because I'm multiplying by 0 over here, right? I mean, this is 0 equals 6. It is a false statement. So that's always going to happen when you have a matrix that doesn't have an inverse. And this will be relevant later on in, I think, uh, two videos from now where we look at solving systems of equations by representing them as matrices. You'll see that you can't do it when the system doesn't actually have a solution, and when you can solve them, we will be using the matrix inverse. So again, this is not a proof by any means, it's just a demonstration, but it is true, and you'll have to trust me on it or look up the proof yourself. Continuing on down. The determinant is an attribute of matrices that we can calculate that tells us some information about the matrix, such as whether or not it has an inverse. Now I'm going to go ahead and open up this web page right here, and I'll try and remember to put this link in the video description, but of course you can just access the file directly from the link in the video description. And let's uh, learn some stuff about the determinant. Okay, the website is mathinsight.org slash determinant underscore matrix, and I'm going to zoom in here. I just want to look at the diagrams a little bit. So here is a generic 2x2 two two matrix with A, B, C, and D representing whatever numbers we might want to put into a 2x2 two two matrix. Then we can calculate the determinant, which by the way only applies to square matrices. So the determinant, abbreviated DET, as it is in MATLAB, of our matrix equals A times D minus B times C. It's basically the product of this diagonal minus the product of this diagonal. And that's pretty easy to calculate, and at some point, if you keep taking math classes, or even relatively early on, somebody will probably make you calculate this by hand. However, when we get up to even a slightly larger matrix, such as this 3x3, three three, things get a lot more complicated. Here is the determinant of that 3x3 three three matrix. It is A times the determinant of this submatrix minus B times the determinant of this submatrix plus C times the determinant of that submatrix, which scrolled off the screen because I zoomed in too much. All right, there it is. And then you could write out the calculation all like this. I wouldn't recommend memorizing this. I mean, you could. Uh, I actually had to do it in a class. But I thought that was kind of useless, and I still do. So thankfully, MATLAB is going to do this calculation for us. But I do want to emphasize that there's nothing mysterious about this calculation. It is simply some multiplications, additions, and subtractions. A lot of them, it would be tedious to do ourselves, but there's nothing like mystical or mysterious about this. It's a basic calculation. Going back to MATLAB, the way to calculate the determinant is to use DET. So the determinant of A is DET parentheses A. Let's run this section. All right, there's our matrix A. It has a determinant of zero. That determinant of zero tells us that the matrix does not have an inverse. And then I tried to calculate the inverse again, even though it's literally the same matrix as above. So what if we change our matrix slightly? I literally just changed the 2 right here to a 3. Now let's see what happens. Well, this time, matrix A is different. Its determinant is different. It's negative 2. And it does have an inverse, and that is that inverse right here. And then when we multiply A times its inverse, this is what we get. Not a perfect identity matrix, because this value isn't technically 0, but it's really, really close. And the reason it's not zero is simply a rounding error on MATLAB's part. It really should be a zero here. So any determinant other than zero means that your matrix has an inverse. Determinant of zero means that your matrix does not have an inverse. So here is simply a bigger matrix, a three by three. Let's run it for this one. And we get a bit of a weird result. So let's scroll up and see what happened here. So there's our original matrix. I just threw in literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And its determinant is this. Is that zero? Well, technically no. Is it really close to zero, like suspiciously close to zero? Yes, right? This is roughly 6.66 times 10 to the negative 16th power. Very, very small. Now, when I try and take the inverse, 
It kind of works. MATLAB gives me a warning saying that the matrix is either close to singular or badly scaled, which I gotta admit, I don't actually know what that means, but it's close to not having an inverse. And then they give us this value right here, which I'm not sure what that represents. But it does give us an inverse, and this is the inverse right here. Now, if you look at these values and think to yourself, hmm, that's suspicious, that's good, that's a good instinct. You should always look at your results and ask yourself, does this make any sense at all? Is this a reasonable result? And if you're dealing with extremely large or extremely small values, then it's possible that you might have some values multiplied by 10 to the 15th power, or even 10 to the 16th. But for our purposes, when we started out with these single digit integers, this seems unlikely, unless something has gone wrong. And then, when we multiply a times its own inverse, or its supposed inverse, which is not correct, we get this right here. That is very much not an identity matrix, and it's not like a small rounding error away from an identity matrix either. It's like way off. So this is just something to be aware of. MATLAB is imperfect. It can't perfectly represent numbers with decimal places that go on and on and on and on. So we can get some weird results, and we got to be able to handle that. Continuing on down. All right, uh, slightly different matrix right here. Let's see if we expect it to have an inverse or not based on its determinant. And I'm going to use three different sets of if statements, checking that determinant to see what we think. All right, so I run it. Here's my matrix right here. It is not the same matrix as before. It's not one, two, three, right? It's different. Its determinant is zero. So we don't expect it to have an inverse. All right, and printing out three times in a row is that the matrix is singular. It does not have an inverse, which is correct. Let's see how we got that to print out. So first I said if d, which is the variable containing the determinant, if it is equivalent to zero with the double equal sign, then print out that the matrix is singular. Otherwise, print that it has an inverse. And that works fine. But I've got this note here that it's dangerous. And you'll see why in just a second. Now, here's what I think is a better way. And the absolute value is necessary, by the way. Let's take the absolute value of d and see if it's less than 10 to the negative 10th power, or less than this number right here. And that works. Now, is there anything special about 10 to the negative 10? No. I just picked this as an arbitrary cutoff, as my way of saying, hey, I think that's close enough to zero that we're gonna count it as zero. Will that always work? Not necessarily. You need to know if in the context of whatever calculation you're doing, it's reasonable to get numbers that small. If it is, you need to figure out a different way to figure out if the matrix has an inverse or not or to figure out what the determinant is accurately. Now my better alternative right here, which is probably easier to use, does have the same limitations as this 10 to the negative 10 thing, but I think it's easier to write. Basically just round your determinant to 10 decimal places and see if that equals zero. I'm pretty sure this is equivalent to this method right here, and it has the same flaw, which is I just chose 10. Is that good enough? It, maybe I needed it to be eight. Maybe I needed it to be like 14 or 16 or something. It depends on the context. And there may be a better way to do this. Feel free to tell me that this is stupid in the comments and you have better code. Continuing on down, I'm actually using magic four here, the magic function to generate a four by four magic matrix. And we're gonna see what its determinant is and whether or not we think it has an inverse. So let's go ahead and run this section. There's our four by four magic matrix. And it, like many other matrices, has a little bit of a tricky determinant. Is this close enough to zero to be considered a rounding error? I think it is. And this illustrates why, of those if statements, the first one is kind of bad. The first if statement says that this matrix has an inverse, which is not correct. The other two if statements say that it does not have an inverse, which is correct. So this if statement, with the just checking if the determinant is equivalent to zero, bad. These two options, a little bit better, although they have their own flaws because of the arbitrarily chosen 10 right here, right? If I'd chosen 14, 10 to the negative 14th, it would have said that this has an inverse, which it does not. And that's the end for this video. In the next video, we're gonna be looking at the cross product of vectors.